Welcome to the Down South Hunting Podcast. This is your host, Mike Higman. I'm running this intro without my co-host, Adam Cruz, because we want to get you to part two of our three-part series on scent control with Dan Infault and John Eberhart as soon as possible. There's just a few things I need to go over before we get into that. First of all, if you have not listened to part one yet, you're not doing this right. Go back and listen to part one. And then we'll come back here, listen to part two, and hopefully in the next week we'll have part three ready to go. Unfortunately, this episode took a little bit longer to get out than I'd hoped. I'm down here in Florida, and I've got a hurricane headed my way. I'm actually trying to get this out late at night before possibly getting evacuated tomorrow. So hopefully there won't be any issues getting part three in, and that'll be done in the next week. Next, I talked to John Eberhart after part one. He was a little bit disappointed that I had cut out his extensive list of uses of activated carbon. So what I wanted to do is put that list back in for you so you could listen to it. He obviously spent quite a bit of time researching it and he was really prepared going into it. So out of respect for him and appreciation for him coming on the show, I wanted to go ahead and play that for you now. Activated carbon has been around since the mid-1800s. It's been used in tons, tons, and tons of stuff. Um, it's you, well, let me give you an idea of what it's used for. Okay? okay. If anybody wants to Google activated carbon, here are some, here are a few of the hundred of adsorptive applications that it's used for around the world. It's used in gas purification, decaffeination, gold purification, metal extraction, drinking water purification, refrigerant gas absorption, sewage treatment, Every country in the world uses activated carbon in their chemical warfare suits. It's used by NASA in their primary life support suits, better known as space suits. It's used in gas masks, water softeners, paint respirators, filters in compressed air, volatile organic compound capture, dry cleaning processes. Every automobile on the face of the earth has activated carbon in it some way, someplace for filtration systems. Uh, it's used in gasoline dispensing operations, groundwater remediation. It's used to absorb radon for testing air quality. It's used for oral ingestion in hospitals worldwide to treat overdose patients. It's used in every intensive care unit in the world to filter harmful drugs from the bloodstream of poisoned patients. It's used to absorb mercury emissions from coal power stations and medical incinerators. It's used to filter vodka and whiskey for of organic impurities. And it's being researched by the U.S. Department of Energy to store natural and hydrogen gas. And in 2007, West Flanders, Universe, West, West Flanders University in Belgium researched water treatment after festivals. And in 2008, Dranatur Music Festival installed an activated carbon installation with plans to utilize that to treat the water at the festival for 20 years. Activated carbon is used in every country on the face of the earth. It was, it was developed by worldwide bodies and in industries, auto industries and stuff like that. So it's not something that Scentlock pulled out of a hat, you know, just like NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy in every country in the world's, you know, for their chemical warfare suits. They didn't just pull it out of a hat and say, hey, let's use this stuff. No, they did it because it's the most absorbent substance known to man at this time. That list is just a testament as to how detail-oriented John Eberhardt is. Obviously, John spent a lot of time and effort into researching that, and uh, there's a lot of good information to share there. Next, I want to thank everyone who downloaded. So far, Part 1 has been record-breaking for the Down South Hunting Podcast. We've had tons and tons of downloads. I really appreciate everyone that's shared it with their friends and encouraged anybody else to download it and also all the positive feedback that we've gotten on it. I also have noticed there's a couple forums that have put up threads on this. I know there's one on the Hunting Beast and also on Saddle Hunter, and hopefully there's some others I I haven't seen yet. 
but I really appreciate it, everybody that's contributing to that. My last ask is if, if you've enjoyed these episodes, please subscribe and give us a review on iTunes. It really helps the podcast out. If you're not used to listening to podcasts, of course, everybody does this. And the reason is it really helps us move up the rankings in podcasts. So if this is something you've enjoyed and you'd like us to do it some more, please leave us a review. Now let's finally get on to the episode. We're going to start out by talking to Dan about something that I know a lot of people have been wondering about. We're going to talk about tests done with scent tracking dogs. Let's go. You know, uh, look at the dog test. And in um, the scent control um, people hate it when you bring up dogs. And they'll fight it tooth and nail. And they'll tell you, well, a dog's doing that for a treat. They're a trained animal. Well, deer's doing that to live, to survive. Not so he gets a cookie. You know, <laughs> but now they're going to say stuff like, uh, um, the dog followed the guy because he broke blades of grass and he disturbed the dirt. But I watched a test that was done with the, I'm not going to name the company because I don't want to get sued, but it's the same company that, uh, that John works with. <laughs> we might be able to <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> they, they did a test on Mythbusters, uh, or Mythbusters did the test. And actually I think I'm partly behind that because I sent them a bunch of letters asking them to do the test and then, then they did. Huh. Um, interesting, but they never acknowledged to me that they were going to do it. So it might not have been me, but I did just before they did the test. The tests have since been removed. They used to be shows. You still find parts of them by Googling it, but the whole shows have been removed after threats of being sued by the company. Um, they got the product from the company, asked the company, how do you want us to use this to remove scent? How should we do this if we want to completely remove scent? And followed the company's um, guidelines to a T. And what they did is they took three guys and the first test was these three guys, um, one of them worked out, he got all sweaty and nasty, wore his old gym shoes and, and stuff, and kind of dressed like me, <laughs> old nasty clothes, right? And then they had another guy who sprays down with the spray, and he takes a shower and wears clean clothes and maybe rubber boots. And then you have the, the last guy who went full-blown what was recommended. And they both ran, they all three ran the same pattern in a different spot, and they had a dog, a bloodhound, followed her scent. And in every single time they did the test, the sweaty guy was the hardest guy to find. And the middle guy was the second hardest guy to find. And the easiest guy to find was the guy in the carbon suit. Now, what's ironic about this is it was every single test had the same results. And Field and Stream did the same test and they had the exact same results um, with the sweaty guy always being the hardest for the dog to locate. Now, that goes into they're going to say, well, you know, they stepped on the grass. The dog followed the broken grass. However, um, when people complained about that, they did the test over, and they completely um, cleaned all of his brand-new scent lock stuff before putting on there. They taped all the joints with uh, uh, scent proof tape and they did it wearing rubber suits and spray washed these guys and they, they showered them down and stuff. And then they took the human scent, they scraped off to the guy and they made a fake trail. And they had a guy make a fake trail from the starting point with his scent, with the guy in the carbon suit scent. And then they had the guy in the carbon suit go a different way. And the dog always went to the carbon suit guy when he smelled the, uh, whatever they used to, to, to trigger the dog. So it didn't follow the actual human scent of the guy laying down the scent. It followed the guy it was supposed to follow. And then they did a box uh, test where they put uh, the same three guys in a box, one out of three boxes, and they walked the dog downwind and see if the dog would alert. And the dog always alert, alerted the fastest and went to the guy fastest that was wearing a scent lock. And the guy who was just clean, they went to the second fastest. And the guy they had the hardest time finding in the box was the guy that was sweaty and nasty. And I have a theory to that because all, every test I've seen, and I've seen hundreds of tests, they always get removed from the Internet and stuff because they get threatened to get sued by the 
uh, scent control police. But um, they all end up with the same results with that sweaty guy being harder to find. And I think there's something to that because the way a deer smells you, or a dog for that matter, is you're shedding off skin cells. And I'm thinking that maybe they stick to that sweat, that they're not coming off as fast. Um, but either way, they're finding the guy in the, the scent lock fastest. And you can't say the guy in the box that doesn't have, where they're not following your ground scent to you, that that dog is smelling broken grass. He's smelling the guy. And this is a guy that used the, the uh, scent lock procedure. He took, he covered his breath. They took care of his hair. The only thing shown was his eyes. And in the last test they did, which had the same results, they actually had it, even his eyes and stuff concealed and, and, and closed. And, uh, you know, if a dog can smell you in that, how can a deer not? So we haven't decided how we're going to play this all out yet, but I've, uh, I'm have i familiar with the field and stream studies you're talking about and also the YouTube videos, which I've sent to, sent to John to make sure he's aware of them. So when we interview mm -hmm. him next week, we're definitely going to go over those. So it'll be interesting to see um, how, how he responds to those. Uh, like you said, those videos, you can't just find the whole thing online. Although I believe... With a subscription on YouTube, you might be able to watch uh, that whole video if you have a subscription to Discovery. But I know they won't show the whole episode. But in agreement with what you said, the last test that they did, um, they had him in a chemical suit. Uh, they washed him down with acetone in between layers. And they even had a gas mask on him that they put in reverse so it would filter the air as he exhaled instead of inhaled. And... I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, uh, I I don't know how that deer or how the dog was able was able to get any scent. I mean, he was in a fully sealed suit. It wasn't even like a breathable suit. I, I'm really interested to hear what John's going to have to say about that. The whole thing about the dog test, that is an absolute joke. All right, well let's and let's I jump into you. that. So let me let me uh, I'll I'll set it up real quick. Um, okay. Field and Stream did some tests, and uh, there have been probably some other dog tests, but actually there's there's a couple we'll talk about. Um, the first one is, is Field and Stream did a test where they brought in a drug dog, and also I guess is um, good for tracking people as well, and they set up some boxes, and, and they tried several different things. They've tried, they tried sprays, they tried soaps, they tried a lot of different things, and basically they said that none of them really helped. Um, so go ahead and explain why, why that test isn't, isn't valid in your mind. Well, I've never seen that one. I mean, obviously sprays, sprays aren't going to do squat. You know, some of these TV guys, they spritz a little sodium bicarbonate spray on them and think they're okay. That's, that's <laughs> a joke. Sodium bicarbonate is ba bacon soda and it has a minute amount of absorptive capacity. That's why people put it in the refrigerator for absorbing odors out of the refrigerator. But that's, that, that doesn't do squat. The ones that get me is where they, I was watching this one YouTube video and here's this dude in this plastic suit. It wasn't set like it was just totally immersed in plastic. Had a, had a respirator you know, get some sort of a gas mask over his face. His head was totally covered. So, I mean, this guy literally, let me put it this way. If he had absolutely zero odor, zero odor whatsoever, and he weighed 160 pounds, which is probably what the guy weighed, because I kind of looked at his body frame, well, he walked someplace. He walked through this field. And then they let a dog go, and the dog followed his trail. I mean, think about that. Seriously, yeah. think about that. Why would a dog be able to follow a trail of a man with no odor that walked through a field? Well, I'm not going to cheat because you already told me the answer to this, so I'll let you explain it. <laughs> <laughs> it's because every step this person takes, he disrupts the ground. He's breaking grasses, he's breaking weeds, he may break a twig, whatever. And a dog that's trained to follow a trail can follow a disrupted ground just from the weight of a 150 or 60 pound person walking on it, even if there's absolutely zero human odor whatsoever. Any dog could do that that was trained to do that. 
My son owned two Bavarian bloodhounds, and they could follow a trail with no human odor as long as it was ground disruption. I've had many times where I've had deer cut my entry route to my stand, and you know, they'll casually turn and walk down my trail. You know, they're sniffing the vegetation and sniffing the ground, and they definitely smell something. They're smelling the ground disruption. But I guarantee you they're not smelling any human odor because where I hunt, which is an extremely pressured area, is Michigan's most pressured state in the country for bow hunting, if there, if there was any human odor on the ground, those mature deer does would spook. So they were smelling ground disruption and trying to figure out what it was, what kind of an animal or what made that smell, because there was a ground disruption odor. And eventually they would just lose interest and saunter on and go on about their business. So, so that's relatively common, just as a, you know, that would be the same as you or I walking through a dew covered grass field and then turning around and you could see where we walked because we disrupted the dew. Just as we can visually see disrupted dew behind us or watch where a golf ball rolls on a dew covered green on an early morning tea time. You know, you can see where the golf ball rolled. Mm-hmm. Well, just as we can visually see stuff like that, a, an, an animal or especially a trained dog can easily, easily scent trail a ground disruption. The only way I would put any credibility to any sort of a scent control test would be I would get to control it and I would want to have and I would want to be the person in the suit. I would want to be totally wrapped in my scent lock suit. I would get a new suit, you know, deact reactivate it. I'd have rubber boots on that I've had for quite a few years so there was no odor on that. Wear my face mask, head cover and I would want to be dropped on a long, long rope because I even wouldn't, I wouldn't want the propellers of the chopper to disrupt much. So I'd want to be dropped down into a field with a long rope. And then I would just lay there. And then I would want somebody with a trained dog to walk 50 yards downwind, straight across from me downwind, and see if that dog could smell me when it got downwind of me. And that I guarantee awesome. it wouldn't be able to. Adam. It would not be able to because my son, my son Chris, did that in Germany. Okay. He did that test with a TV guy. We need to start a GoFundMe page. We, <laughs> yes, that would be <laughs> that would be the most epic test ever. Yeah. Just pay well, for all a these other tests are just yeah. Yeah, all these other tests are just BS. Because anytime anything's walking and disrupting the ground, that test is irrelevant. Period. End of discussion. Well, I got one you didn't see. At least I hope you didn't see it because, uh, well, anyways, I like, I, I don't like watching hunting shows. I don't like watching hunting videos or TV, which is kind of ironic because of what I do, but I, I love, um, forensic shows and, uh, police shows. And there's a, a show called, uh, I think it's forensic files. See that one or cold case, but one of them played, um, played an episode where, uh, this is real life stuff. It's kind of made up thing, you know? Um, they're hunting this guy who's a wanted murderer and fugitive, and they can't find him. Well, they get a call that he's at a motel in Texas and uh, living out of this motel. So they get their troops together, race down there, and they get to the hotel, and they, they surround it, and they go in there, and he's not in there. And they get the hotel guy out there, and he says, well, the guy left three days ago. He left on foot. He didn't have a car, and the guy had no money left or anything. He's just out hiding. He ran out of money, so they, he had to leave the motel. So he left on foot three days earlier. This is in a crowded city. There's people walking up and down the sidewalks. Everything's concrete. They went inside that room, and the room had been cleaned by the maid. And they looked around, and in the garbage can, there was one item, and it was a Coke can, a soda can. And uh, they took that soda can out, and they asked the maid if it was hers. And she said, no, it was in there, and that she typically... If, if there's one item in there or something, she'll just leave it in the garbage can. So they took that can with the rubber gloves on and they had a bloodhound sniff it. And the bloodhound followed that guy's scent out of that, that hotel, across that asphalt parking lot, through the ditch, across the street, onto a concrete sidewalk where everybody's walking. There's people walking while it's following them. Up the sidewalk, 
and it goes up the sidewalk for about 100 yards, goes through a woods, crosses a river, and goes up to a tent site where this guy's living in a tent in the woods, and they catch him. That's crazy. Yeah, it's... that's crazy. <laughs> Are you trying to beat that? <laughs> <laughs> now, now I will say, so the field and stream test, the first test that they did, and, and by the way, we'll put links to the field and stream tests and whatever Google videos we can find. One thing with, you can't watch the whole episode, but there is a website out there that does a summary of what their findings are of the episode. So basically you put two Mm -hmm. and two together. When they do the chemical suit, you look at what happened afterwards, even though they don't show it. Um, So, but the first field and stream test, um, the guy did two versions. He did uh, a stinky version and all cleaned up version. So basically he was all sweaty and stinky, left his clothes on, uh, or the first version was a clean one. Uh, So he walked through the woods, didn't touch anything, walked on short trimmed grass, didn't touch anything. And then he did a, a stinky version where it was the same thing, except he went through high grass and was putting his hands all over everything. And what's interesting is they brought the dog in like three or four hours later and the dog couldn't find either trail. Um, and the reason they gave is that it was really dry and windy. And apparently that's, mm-hmm. you know, not good scenting conditions. Um, so, uh, it's it's kind of crazy where you got one instance where they can follow a guy from a hotel room three days later, and another instance. Mm-hmm. This you know it's a it was a police dog, and I believe it was a dog they use for scent tracking as well. Um, I know it's for sure they're drug dogs, but I believe they use them for scent tracking people as well. Um, so anyway, it was real interesting how there's a lot of variables that you know are really even tough to understand how that can work. Okay, so John, going back to some of those stories you shared, which uh, are very vivid as far as helping us understand how how you came to that understanding, I know what a lot of the critics say, and a a lot of guys that say, oh, well, if you had deer downwind and and they didn't wind you, uh, it must be the thermals. Uh, So I know that you understand thermals and probably have some experiences with that. What, What do you have to say to those guys? I've hunted 53 years. I hunted 35 years without snout lock. I know what getting winded is. I don't care what those guys say. What they say to me is irrelevant. I've hunted 17 years paying zero attention to the wind. I think I know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's pretty clear. Now, I know part of your strategy is hunting high up in a tree. Does that have anything to do with wind or is that just so you don't get picked off? Uh, it's, it's so I don't get picked off. I mean, it helps with the wind. There's no question. The higher you hunt, the, the more your air current's going to go above the deer. But I used, I've always hunted high. So I got winded when I hunted high before I had a good scent control regiment. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of negates that thought. Dan, do you find that a lot of times hunting higher kind of gets your air current, you know, out of the way of, of maybe deer might be walking? Absolutely. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is most of the time I can't hunt high. Mature bucks have a knack for living on edge. They live on thick edge. And if you don't push the limits and get close enough, you don't see them in daylight. And most of the time when you get close enough, it's scrubby little trees. And if there is a big tree, you're trying to shoot through heavy cover. So the higher you get, the more obstacles you got. So although I'd like to be up there, a lot of times I'm six to eight feet off the ground. How important is uh, maybe your access routes as far as ground scent and that kind of stuff goes? Well, that is obviously important um, in, in more than one way. Um, in the way that you don't want deer to know where, you, where you're going or how you're getting in there. You don't want to cross certain trails or whatever. You don't want to burn bridges someplace you're going to hunt again. You know, you want to go around that if you're going to hunt it at some point. Um, but I also walk right through bedding areas that I, either can't hunt because of the setup or whatever, or, or whatever. Um, I'll go through, uh, areas where I don't intend to hunt on purpose to leave a scent trail. So deer don't bed there, you know, so that it forces them into stacking into the areas I do hunt. John, uh, what about accessing your stand? Because, uh, you know, typically a hunter worries about not walking upwind of bedding areas, or they're worried about their their trail, you know, that deer may cross that trail. Do you, do you consider no. deer movement at all when you're accessing stands? Uh, the only time I worry about spooking deer with an entry is if I'm walking along the edge of a bedding area, then I'm worried about spooking something that may hear me. Okay. Not, not anything that's going to win me. I'm not worried about my win. 
my wind is irrelevant. So, because I'm not leaving any human odors, so I'm not worried about my wind currents flowing anywhere and spooking anything. And I, I'm not worried about my entry route. I've had deer walk down my entry route many, many times. I've had three different three coyotes walk through weeds that I walk through, weed fields that I walk through, and not have a, not have a clue. Hmm. So I, I have no issues or no concerns about deer crossing or walking down. A lot of times, in when you're hunting in bedding areas. It's very common if you make an entry and exit route for deer to use that as incorporate that as part of their runway, part of their route, you know, path of least resistance. So, um, in fact, I got, I hunt one piece of property in Southern Michigan and the property owner, um, he lets me hunt in the swamp. I'm the only guy, even his brothers and his nephews and stuff, he does not let hunt in the swamp. I'm the only guy he lets in the swamp because, because of my scent control. He says he's, I'm I'm not concerned about you spooking deer. Yeah. So well, and that's a pretty good relationship to have right there. Be the only guy I, that hunts in the And he hunts the outside the swamp, so if I was spooking deer, they'd be snorting and he'd know it. <laughs> and yeah. that's, that never happens. So I have literally 50% of the deer when I'm hunting are downwind of me. I have deer cross my entry routes at least 50% of my hunts, and it's not an issue. And it always was an issue. Always used to be an issue. I was just going to ask about in, including cover scents in that as, as far as like urine goes or using a nose jammer product or even so much as like stepping into some cow manure on your way to your tree stand. No How way. do you feel? Uh, no, don't do it? No way. Nope. Nothing. Zero. <laughs> Listen, I hunt where there's 320,000 other bow hunters in this state. And why in the world would I want to do the same things they do? That's a very That's good point. one thing. If you want to be successful and you're in a pressured area, you've got to do things different than everybody else. Everybody else is using scents. They're rattling. They're grunting. They're using cover scents. They're trying all kinds of stupid tricks. And, you know, I hunt destination spots. I hunt a, when I'm hunting a location, I want that location to work on its own merits. I don't want anything else to fudge up anything for a deer coming into that spot. I don't want a buck coming into that on its on the spot location's own merits and then smell something that's foreign and shouldn't be there and make him change his mindset or be more aware as he's coming in and be more apt to pick me. Do you use any commercial scents like when you're hunting no. trace or any of that stuff? No. Never. Okay. Nope. Don't use cover scents. Don't use sex scents. Don't use uh, apple or acorn or any of that stuff. Uh, I go as free as possible. I let my destination sites work on their own merits. I was going to ask about the detergent and the soap and, and all that. Do you have a company or a brand that you recommend to, for everyone? Arm and Hammer. <laughs> Arm and Hammer. <laughs> <baking soda. laughs> I like it. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I'm going to piss off a lot of deer hunting companies with this. I buy most of my scent free stuff at like Walgreen or CVS. I can buy six bars of hypoallergenic, no perfumes, no dyes, uh, dove soap for like eight bucks. And I can buy a gallon of Arm and Hammer nonsense or hypoallergenic, no dyes, no perfumes detergent for five bucks. Um, you can buy non, you know, hypoallergenic, no perfumes, no dyes, shampoos. Uh, you can buy any antiperspirant from a, any major brand that's unscented. So I get most of that stuff from, you know, pharmaceutical stores. So really, that's not really an additional cost if you'd be using those type of stuff anyway. Yeah, I know baking soda is probably a lot cheaper, actually, than, than most of it. It's, it's a lot cheaper than Tide. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't use baking soda for anything. But I mean, every every company, Tide, Purex, uh, Arm and Hammer, all of them make hypoallergenic detergent. Okay. You know, because there's a lot of people that are allergic to everything, and they have to have hypoallergenic detergents and soaps and shampoos, um, and they have no dyes and no perfumes in them, and they're premium quality. <laughs> Trust me on that one. <laughs> yeah, I actually thought it was really interesting in your book. You mentioned. Uh that you still, um, you know, you don't have a separate washer and dryer, which I know a lot of these hardcore scent control guys that, um, I, I don't know whether they're using activated carbon suits or not, but um, they'll actually have a separate washer and dryer. And I thought it was really interesting that um, 
that you even your wife during hunting season will still use scented soap. So you'll you'll uh, actually run a load of like scouting clothes or something first or towels uh, to get yep. that smell out of there. Yeah, I I will wash I wash the towels that I actually use when I shower before I go hunting. The towels that I use are washed in scent free detergent and kept in a their own little place. Okay, so when I get ready to uh, deabsorb my clothes in the dryer, you know, I'll I'll wet a couple of those towels and throw them in there first. So that if there is any residual you know, odor from any dryer sheets that my wife uses, it'll, it'll get rid of that. And anything else that's left in there, you know, the activated carbon will, you know, once you shut the dryer off and put it in the airtight container, it, the carbon will absorb it anyway. I mean, I'll say your whole system that, you know, it's like, like we said earlier, you go through it in the book. Um, it, it's pretty mild compared to a lot of the other things I've read about, you know, people that are real serious about scent control. Yeah, well, you know, some of the people that crack me up is they they get all freaky about you know keeping their regular hunting clothing clothing as air you know <laughs> as human odor free as possible. You could take you could take any permeable hunting suit. Most hunting suits are permeable. You know what I mean by permeable? They allow airflow through them. Okay. Okay. You can take any hunting suit that's permeable and you can hang it outside for a year. And it has no human odor on it whatsoever. As soon as you put it on, your body is emitting gaseous and liquid odors 100% of the time. So as soon as you put it on, it's not going to be long, very many minutes before your body odors molecules start permeating through that suit. So it can be as scent free as possible but once you put it on your body odor is going to start permeating through it that's the cool thing about activated carbon that's what that's absorbing it's absorbing those molecules it's not allowing them to permeate through the suit dan what do you feel about cover scents like um either guys that smoke their clothes or or use pine or there's actually a a product that's becoming pretty popular called nose jammer i'm not sure if you're familiar with it but it uses vanilla that's supposed to overwhelm a deer's scent uh, sense of smell. Do you believe any of those could help or work at all? I don't believe it. Um, I'm really not familiar with the product nose jammer. It's never really caught my attention. I hear people talk about it a lot, but I just roll my eyes and walk away. But, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> as far as cover, cover sense, they can't work. And the reason they can't work is because a deer has a vomer nasal organ and what a deer can do with that organ. Um, one thing it can do with that organ, a lot of what that organ does is unknown because nobody's ever done the science on it. But what they do know is that it separates odors. Um, when a deer smells something that doesn't smell like me and you smell, it smells every ingredient of what it smells. So like if you got gasoline on you, it smells gasoline and it smells you. It doesn't, doesn't just smell gasoline. It doesn't have an, it doesn't smell the overpowering scent. And the reason for that is, is that a deer's nose is so strong um, that if it, it would get overpowered by one scent, it wouldn't be able to smell anything else. It would perish because the whole woods is, you know, there's something going to be strong upwind, you know, so it smells a, a blend. It can smell the different, different odors, no matter how minute they are. Mm-hmm. So if you put fox urine on your boots, it smells you and fox urine. And if you believe in scent control, which I don't, you'd probably have to believe that that odor that you put on you is going to cause them to um, make attention to that scent because it's a strong scent, and then they're for sure going to notice you. Well, I think you're going to notice you anyway. Well, this, this is kind of funny. I'm I, I'm staying neutral in this whole thing, but I do want to mention this. It, that does kind of remind me of, uh, you know, when you use those scent sprays in the bathroom after you go to the bathroom, and basically it smells like somebody took a dump in the woods, not just like the woods. So. <laughs> Right. <laughs> maybe maybe it works kind of <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> it, I might use that sometime. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Given the fact that you use your scent as almost using your scent as a tactic or as an advantage against a, a deer, if if there were some scent control measure, say like a a pill that didn't have any side effects that you could take that would completely eliminate 
your human odor uh, for hunting purposes is and it, you know or affordable and all that stuff. Is that something you think you would you would take? I think if that was out, I'd probably quit hunting. <laughs> um, to to me, um, and this is getting down to the roots of it all. Um, I believe there is nothing that will trick a deer's nose. I I think there is absolutely nothing you can do that is currently on the market that'll fool a deer. They're coming close in some areas, but there's nothing right now where you can beat a deer. And I hope they never, ever, ever find something. Because I can tell you right now, if I could be sent free, I could walk right up to the bed of deer and kill them. Mm-hmm. I, could, I could kill a giant every year, just walk up to it and kill it. And I know I could because I slip into those bedding areas real close to those bedded bucks. I know where they're at. The only thing stopping me is they're looking down when smelling behind them. If I could come in from straight behind them, I know I could be quiet enough to kill them in their beds. Matter of fact, I've gotten a few of my biggest bucks by creeping up on them bedded and shooting them. Um, but the thing that gets you is they set up for scent. Most of the time, those bedding areas, you can drop milkweed from any way around it. And at least at some point within a five minute period, your wind will go straight to that deer, no matter how, how you are around that deer. That's why they bed there. That's why they have the bigger, the buck, the older, the buck, how they get these core areas that they bed in because they're bedded in the spot where they can smell and see anything approaching, smell, see, and hear anything approaching. But if you could take away that smell thing, I'd walk right in and kill them in their beds. I'd have no problem doing that. That'd be a bad day for big bucks. Yeah, and and to me, that would take all the fun out of it. It's yeah. a chess game. It's supposed to be you against the deer. You, you know, it's kind of ironic to me. It, just, it almost blows my mind that somebody would choose to limit themselves to something like a, a recurve stick bow, um, a wooden arrow, and only be able to shoot 15 yards because of the type of bow they choose, and then go and use scent elimination. I mean, mm. why don't you just use a rifle then if you're just trying to kill deer? I mean, if it's about the game, if it's about the challenge, if it's about the chase, then I, I, I you know, I hope they never uh, figure out scent control. And that is a tough debate, a tough road to go down. I, I feel like everybody kind of has to choose how they're gonna gonna limit themselves, especially with new technologies like uh, drones and that kind of stuff. I mean, I feel like everybody could kind of put their own ethics on someone else and say, "Oh, well, I don't do that," so you know they're cheating. Um, but I guess everybody and, and has not, their own and advantages. Not, and I'm not saying anybody's cheating or anybody's uh, immoral because of the way they hunt. I'm just saying for me, the way I look at it, it's a chess game. Yeah, it's a hunt between me and that deer and outsmarting it. It's like when I uh, I get hired to scout people's properties. Uh, I've had people who want to kill a deer and will do anything for them. They have me set up snow fences to funnel deer through a little tiny opening. Hmm. And I can do that, and I can make it so that guy kills deer on a regular basis through those little funnels. But I wouldn't hunt like that. I want to. I want that deer to have the wide open forest, and it's me against him one on one, not some little trickery, you know. Yeah, and I think most guys that, that listen to podcasts like this are not the kind of guys who, uh, you know, are hunting high fence areas or that, you know, the, the people that are into it this much, I think, love the challenge of it. Um, you know, they're not the kind of guys who want somebody else to set up a stand for them or, or that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. If you're learning right. all of this stuff and, and you're really into this, I think it's a lot of the DIYers and, and the people who, you know, are figuring things out on their own and love the challenge of it. Right. So you said some things are kind of getting close uh, to to helping um, eliminate some scent. I, that makes me wonder, how do you feel about using ozone either for, you know, eliminating scent that's on your exactly clothes or in a stand? To. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I say that's getting close, um, I don't think eliminating the scent on your, stand, your, your clothes will help you in any way. But if you got into a, an enclosed blind, you had an opening on the wind side and you had ozonic thing in there and wind blowing through that hole. I do think that that's coming pretty close to eliminating your scent. That, that stuff works pretty good. Um, it's not something I would ever use or care to. Um, but I can see them getting pretty close. The only good thing about that is it causes cancer. So people probably won't want to use it. Don't want to get too enclosed yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You won't use people won't go too crazy with it. Hopefully, I, that's 
that, that's going to be a real blind. hardcore hunter when when uh, yeah when when you're able to get crazy doses with it and people just go ahead anyway. John, what about uh, I know in your book you mentioned ozone as well. What are your thoughts on one using ozone as eliminating odors off of off of your clothing and gear? Uh, basically at home, and then second, what do you think about using that in the stand? Well, I've never used an ozone machine over my head. Uh, ozone, the Ozone 6, when that first came out, they sent me three of them to test, and they did exactly what they said they would do. I First thing I did is I put a, I got an airtight container, drilled a hole in it, put the ozone tube in it, and I put some stinky old sneakers in it and left it on for 24 hours and it did get rid of the you know the stinky foot odor no doubt about it it definitely did that but big but it it left a very strong odor of whatever ozone leaves and it was when you're hunting mature bucks and you're hunting in a pressured area you know Kansas, Iowa, those kind of states are freebies. I can go kill a 140 inch in a week out there anytime. But when you're hunting a, a Michigan, a PA, a New York, a West Virginia, places where, you know, you got 10 to 20 bow hunters per 640 acres, in those types of areas, three and a half year old bucks have usually been shot at and hit. And they're very, very smart. They have PhDs at avoiding hunters. So those are different types of animals. And, I don't know. When you're hunting there, you just everything you got to do everything absolutely perfect to get an opportunity. And when I I primarily set up on destination spots, I'm usually hunting primary scrape areas, uh, lost apple trees out in the timber someplace with good security cover around perimeter security cover around them, or white oaks. You know, I'm a destination guy, and a lot of times if there's no mast or fruit on the trees, you know, I'll hunt some pinch points and some transition cover between a bedding and a feeding area or d- between two bedding areas during the rut phases. But anytime you're hunting at a destination spot, and if I were to use that Ozone 6 machine to supposedly treat my clothing, um, it's leaving a strong enough foreign odor that it would definitely without question affect the mindset of a mature buck that was coming into that destination spot. And I don't think he would come in. Uh, I I just hunt clean. I'm a clean guy. You know, I want to be, I want to be scent free and I don't use scents and that ozone thing leaves an odor. And I would never use anything that leaves an odor because, you know, sure. If you want to kill a year and a half old and two and a half year old bucks and does and fawns and stuff like that, I'm sure it'll be fine. But if you want to kill three and a half year old and older bucks in in pressured areas where they have PhDs at avoiding hunters, anything for an order is a negative to a kill. So I would never use it. And I have talked to guys that have used the ozone machines that you hang over your head, and they said they work pretty good. But they do leave an order. They do have an order, and they also said if it's a windy day, the wind blows enough human odor through it before the ozone machine can do anything about it that they still have human odor downwind if there's if there's a, a you know five or ten mile an hour wind dan as as far as wind goes what do you feel about hunting just off winds where uh you know you're you're trying where a deer might want to have the wind in his advantage but uh you're just off of that type of thing do you think that's helpful or worth paying attention to so probably half of my setups are just off winds. I'm playing the wind all the time with uh, which side I set up and stuff on. And that's a big part of being mobile is uh, I'm hunting based on the wind rather than stuck in a stand no matter what the wind is. You know, I'm moving around a lot. And uh, I'm looking at the wind. A lot of times, uh, like say in hill country, um, when the food's up top, those deer are bedding on, on the points when the wind's blowing over the top. That's where they bed. So if they're feeding up top, the only time you're on them points is when the wind's blowing down them. You got to set up up wind of them. If you you wait for the wind to change, they're not bedding there. So you have to set there when the wind's blowing at them. So in those cases, I get that wind where it's just off, where it's in their favor, but I get to the side where it's blowing over the over the bottom to the side. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of times when I set up with a just off wind. What about uh, something else, real quick? Is I know I know the thermal tunnel is something that. 
or a wind tunnel is something that you try to focus on in, in more hilly areas. Um, how does that work as far as deer winding you and, and choosing a location with that? Well, the, what happens with the thermal tunnel is that um, during the day, thermals rise. Um, so when you get on a, a leeward side, a buck's going to bed on that leeward side right where that thermal rise um, meets the actual wind current coming over the top. So you can actually smell from above and below. Um, that might sound kind of odd because people think thermals go straight up, but they don't on a hill because when the wind goes over, it causes a vacuum and pulls the uh, thermal current up the hill instead of straight up. Anybody that's hunted on hills long enough will tell you that, they, that the wind's blowing one way on the top and they get on the side of the hill and it's blowing up the hill the other way on the side of the hill. And that's why. So which side of that tunnel, how do you, how do you choose where you're going to hunt based on that? Um, I like to hunt above it, but, uh, that ain't always the case. Uh, sometimes you gotta hunt below it, but, uh, it's important to be high so that you get above that tumbling air. Um, usually if you get busted, it's right when they come underneath you and all that wind's tumbling around. So I try to get up high, which is why I like being above them because if you're below up high, isn't as high as when you're above them. John, you mentioned earlier that 60% of bucks are, are, I think you said 60% of Pope and Young bucks are killed during the rut period. And I know you yep. focus on that quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you hunt? And I know that, hold on a minute, Mike. Yeah. I know that because all of those stats are in my books. Okay. In my books, I have hunter density stats for every state, PNY entry ratios for every state. And every state I researched with the PNY summary books, uh, Every every state, almost sixty to sixty five percent of all the PNY bucks enter. Usually a three week period out of whatever the three or four month season that they have. Yeah, Adam, I think you'll agree with me on this. That's it's the information on that is is really good, especially if if you're looking at hunting out of state, just getting an idea of, or, or even in your own state, get an idea of what you're up against. Yeah, when I was, yeah. I've been trying to plan an out of state whitetail hunt for the past year or two and just kind of looking at different states. And I've used your books to go off the numbers, which I know over the years those numbers have changed, but I'm sure the, the spread has probably stayed pretty close to the same. Yeah, they're pretty similar. Kansas is hands down the number one. Iowa, Nebraska, uh, North Dakota, Southern Illinois, those are all just phenomenal, phenomenal places to go. Very, very minimal pressure. Lots of mature bucks. They're relatively stupid, easy to get on. Sounds good to me. Yeah. And <laughs> and I always like to go, uh, be, because because I focus on hunting pressured pressured whitetails, you know, I, I focus on hunting in Michigan until Michigan's gun season opens before I go out of state, which is November 15th. Uh, just typically, the only two states I've went to in a few years has been uh, Iowa and Kansas, because both of those states, their gun seasons open in December, so I can go there during Michigan's gun season, which opens November 15th, and I can continue bow hunting in those states until December. Okay. And, and they're it just having to be probably the two best states, yeah. Iowa and Kansas yeah. are the two best states in the country. Um, when, when you're using those rut-type tactics, do you try to hunt on the downwind side of uh, doe bedding areas? Uh, I know that's a typical strategy. Is So will you no. look at the wind just for... Um, there's only one time I ever... I can cut you off because I know where yeah. you're going here. Yeah. Uh, there's only one time I ever, ever pay attention to wind direction, and that is if I'm setting up a location during postseason on a primary scrape area. If I'm setting up on a primary scrape area... Winds are typically out of the northwest. I will typically set up if there's a if there's an adequate tree. I'll typically set up about 15 to 20 yards on the southeast side of the scrape area, because oftentimes a mature buck will set check a primary scrape area from downwind. Okay. So by me setting up 15 or 20 yards downwind of the scrapes, if he comes in and set checks from 30 yards downwind. I've got a 15 yard shot. Right. He'd and still he be downwind of you, and works his... but only 10 yeah, yards downwind, not 30. Yeah. He'd, well, if I'm setting 15 or 
well, if I'm 20 yards off the scrapes and he's 30 yards, yeah, he'd be 10 yards for me. Yeah. The downwind part doesn't come into the equation for me. Okay. He's, I'm just saying I'm setting up on the downwind side of the scrapes because he's scent checking it from the downwind side. Right. So if I set up on the scrapes, let's say I set up on the northwest side of the scrapes, and the scrape area is going to be probably, you know, 10 yards. You know, it's usually a little opening. So if I'm setting up on the northwest side, because I'm not paying attention to wind direction per the scrape area, and he comes 30 yards downwind of the scrapes, I'm not going to have a shot. If he's sent checking from downwind, I'm not going to get a shot. Whereas if I'm set up on the downwind side of the scrapes, 10 or 15 yards off the scrapes, and he comes in 30 yards downwind or 40 yards downwind of the scrapes, because he's just sent checking them, I will still get a shot at him. Cool. Did you understand that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, That's the only time I ever pay attention to wind direction is when I'm setting up on a primary scrape area. Dan, one of the reasons we're so interested to talk to to John as well is because he is one of the few guys out there left that are saying ignore the wind. You know, I think the industry as a whole has said, oh, you still play the wind, but this is this is going to help, you know. Um, But but obviously, John's had a ton of success. I don't know anybody with the exception of John. John's the only one I've ever heard in my life. So they've never been busted by a deer. Oh, and, and I'll stick. I've, I've read some of John's stuff, and he'll even say he still gets. And and we'll ask him during uh, his interview, but I think he'll say he still gets busted once in a while. And uh, oh, really? Because yes. I just read an article uh, t- that came out today. A guy put it on my bench. He goes, "Is this the guy that you're huh. debating with?" Yeah. I said, "Yeah, that is." And right at the top of the article, it says, "I have not been busted by a deer in 18 years." Since the day I started using Scentlock. It's in Deer and Deer Hunting. It came it just came out. I'll have to take a look at that before we talk to him. That's that's interesting. In his book he says he he gets busted once in a while, but usually they can figure out what the problem was. Maybe a uh something in their backpack or you know, usually they they'll go back and, and look at why it, it might have been and it's usually a lapse in what they you know, in what their procedure usually is. So um well I'll have to check that article out. Okay. That sounds interesting. Well, I know people who followed the full procedure. I mean, uh, breath, eat and diet, all that, and they still get busted. Well, I'm going to cut it off right there. And to start out part three, we'll hear John's response as to when the last time he was busted while he was hunting. I think you'll be pretty interested to hear that. We're also going to talk about the Rudker study that they did on the scent lock suits. We're going to talk about the lawsuit against scent lock. We're going to talk about tactics and strategies that both John and Dan use. And we're also going to get into some success stories that they've both had. So we've got a lot of really cool stuff coming. I hope you guys are enjoying these episodes. Uh, if it is something you're enjoying, we are sharing these on our social media accounts. We'd really appreciate it if you would share them on yours and uh, post them on any Facebook groups you're part of. Would be would be really cool if you guys would do that as well. And I will try to get the next part out as soon as possible. I'm about to get hit by a hurricane, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but keep an eye out on social media, and it'll show up on your feed if you're subscribed. Last thing, don't forget to go to huntinggeardeals.com for all your hunting gear. The site is updated every day, and a lot of the deals only last one day, so you don't want to be missing out on those. They get updated every single morning. Thanks, and we're out down south.